Social ecology is an anti-capitalist, environmentalist, and democratic ideology. Today, Blair Taylor from the Institute for Social Ecology will come on to talk about social ecology. Thanks again for coming on. So to begin with, what is social ecology? Social ecology is an interdisciplinary body of ideas that understands ecological problems as intertwined with social problems, more specifically as consequences of the exploitation and domination inherent to hierarchical societies like capitalism. This intertwining of social and ecological problems requires a radical break with the institutions and ideologies that reinforce and perpetuate them, namely capitalism, the state, sexism, racism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression. The social ecology offers an intersectional analysis of hierarchy and domination that includes the social, political, economic, and ecological. This critique is in turn tied to a reconstructive political vision centered on confederal direct democracy, wherein concentric networks of popular assemblies in cities, towns, and neighborhoods create a counterpower of real democratic power where people can reassert control over their own lives and make economic production serve human need, not the other way around. The social ecology was initially developed uh, in the United States during the 60s to early 2000s by foundational theorist Murray Bookchin, who founded the co-founded the Institute for Social Ecology that I work for, and it has been an important influence and tendency within left and ecological movements since the 1960s, including the libertarian wing of the New Left, the anti-nuclear movement of the 1970s, the radical ecology movement and green movement at of the 80s, the alter-globalization or global justice movement of the 90s and early 2000s, the climate justice occupy and occupy movements of the 90s and aughts, and as well, most recently, the, the Kurdish democratic movements in Turkey and Rojava or Syria. Uh, that's another story that we can discuss later on. So in sum, social ecology offers an analysis of the overlapping social and environmental problems of the present, an expansive vision of a free and ecological society beyond capitalism and the state, and a political strategy for how to achieve it. What are your thoughts on more ecologically friendly technologies like nuclear? Well, social ecologists were deeply involved in the anti-nuclear power movement of the 1970s and 80s, highlighting not only the environmental impacts, but also the strong ties to the military industrial complex at the time. So while nuclear energy may produce less direct carbon emissions, uh, the impacts of uranium mining, plant construction, long-term nuclear waste disposal, and the potential for nuclear disasters all mitigate against the idea that nuclear is in fact an ecologically friendly technology. While this technology is evolving and could potentially offer something in the future, uh, in general, soci social ecology focuses instead on changing social relationships rather than technological fixes to social environmental problems. So in regards to energy, this means focusing on changing our endless growth driven driven production and consumption patterns to reduce overall energy needs, meeting them instead by dispersed ecologically and place-specific technologies that are democratically controlled as public utilities. So the social ecology method focuses more on reducing demand rather than changing supply? Social ecology focuses on changing systems, aiming to go beyond the narrow limits imposed by the economistic categories of supply and demand. Social ecology aims to subordinate the economy and its mythology of artificial scarcity to human need and human control. Social ecologists understand that material scarcity and meaningless toil are not timeless features, but specific features of capitalism. In fact, capitalism is a very new social system that's only been around around 500 years, the blink of an eye if you look at the overall scope of human history anthropologically. And it wants to replace the system with a system of production and distribution that is democratically planned from the bottom up, of course, with the aid of computers and modern logistics, which must be ecologized in turn, and oriented not towards never-ending growth and profits, but rather towards meeting human needs in an ecologically sustaining manner. We don't want to continue to shovel human life and natural resources uh, into the sacrificial pits of the twin gods of growth and profit accumulation, a dynamic that's ravaging not only human lives, but also the ecosystems that our lives and all life depends on. So you might say in a way that we want to increase demand, but the demand for a better and fundamentally different way of life than we have under capitalism in the nation state, i.e., having one's livelihood tied to mostly meaningless or harmful work that we don't control, which I'll add is a condition that includes entrepreneurs and capitalists, uh, which are subject to the laws of capitalism just as others. So socially, social ecology aims to abolish homo economicus altogether and replace them with something approximating a zoon politicon, uh, the political animal. This is you know, a creature that exists in a world of deliberation and direct democracy that's not limited by market rationality, but discussing what we want and need as a community and making it happen. 
and not according to market logic and the very narrow constraints of market logic. So in this regard, it aligns with very tr various traditions of libertarian and ecological socialism, anarcho-communism, degrowth, uh, all of which seek non-statist forms of socialism. What are the flaws you see in economic theory? Well, that depends on what school of economics, as there are quite a few with important differences, but we can assume the general pro-market neoclassical or neoliberal model that's been hegemonic for at least the past 40 to 50 years. At root, contemporary economic theory disempowers humans by mystifying the fact that the economy is a human construct subject to our control, not the other way around, which is what it's you know, evolved into. Most economies uh, reverse this, making humans serve an abstraction called, quote unquote, the market or the economy, as if this is some monolithic thing, some godlike, you know, invisible hand that controls our actions. So related, this view of a singular monolithic thing called the economy also obscures the existence of, cl of classes within capitalism, so that when the economy, quote unquote, the singular thing works well for elites or the stock market, it's exploiting the vast majority. So there can be no uh, reconciliation under capitalism of these you know, directly opposed economic interests. And we could add another, the obvious other interests of uh, environmental sustainability. So look at the current boom in the stock market, for example, during COVID, while millions have lost their jobs and are facing eviction. That just underscores, underscores the point that capitalism exists to create profit, not meet human needs. So quote, the quote unquote economy can be doing quite well while people on the planet are being destroyed, while a tiny sliver of humanity benefit and grow ever richer. The basic presumptions of mainstream economics, natural scarcity, the primacy of competition, rational, self-interested, homo economicus, all of these are fantasies that limit our ability to imagine a better world and rationalize the one that we have. Most economic theory projects capitalism back into all of human history when in reality, as I said, it's only about 500 years old. And for that matter, if we look anthropologically, a highly unusual form of social organization. Again, uh, ask any anthropologist, they'll tell you that most human societies lived in fairly egalitarian and highly cooperative social structures, which makes sense given we're highly social creatures. Uh, this modern economic uh, science, quote unquote, is responsible for a sadly stunted view of human nature and potentiality, and a slew of silly human nature arguments against any social improvement, which again, ask an anthropologist, they'll debunk it in a matter of seconds. So social ecology differs from other left and socialist ideologies in that we wish to abolish the economy entirely as a separate and autonomous sphere of human activity by subjecting it to democratic control. Instead, citizens would deliver Deliberate and decide what we want to produce and how to distribute it according to rational and ecological principles, not according to abstractions of what the market wants or what will generate profit. So social ecology is hostile to markets as a fundamentally irrational method of distributing goods and resources, one which rewards asocial and anti-ecological behavior, uh, which is why market-based environmental solutions cannot solve social or environmental problems. We've had 40 years of these and our social and environmental problems just keep getting worse. You can't fight the problems of capitalism with more capitalism, of free markets with more free markets. So we seek a world instead where meeting our basic material needs doesn't take up all of our time and energy, where society is organized to higher aims than simple self-reproduction and survival and maybe a little entertainment or escape on the side. We envision a post-scarcity society of abundance where people contribute in a variety of ways, are not defined solely by their job or what they do to uh, pay the bills where the idea of a job itself has been replaced by a more flexible and satisfying array of necessary human labor from educating each other, care work, taking care of the young and the old and ourselves, raising food, making goods, etc. In this society, no one can be denied having their basic human needs met and nobody can hoard wealth or deny others, regardless of anyone's labor contribution. Much necessary labor in this point can in fact be automated and uh, hopefully in an ecological fashion, uh, technology is evolving at a rapid rate. So a large amount of the work that we do under capitalism is simply useless busy work we have to do in order to survive. So we'd all work less and live, seriously live, more, reframing what it means to be human, unlocking massive stores of human potentiality and not incinerating or devouring the planet to keep buying, selling goods that we don't really need or want, but need under capitalism in order to survive, or at least need to sell under capitalism to survive. So social ecologists look at this barbarous world of all against all, of exploitation, poverty, inequality, alienation, misery, meaningless toil that we don't control, ecological destruction, and we instead posit an alternative, more civilized and democratic eco-socialist world. Interesting. So hypothetically, if somebody were to produce a product through their own labor, do they have a right to it or is it the property of the community? Well, I'd reframe the question or, or turn it back on you. How did they come to possess the raw materials they're laboring on in the first place? Who granted them that quote-unquote right as opposed to someone else? 
property is inherently based on exclusive use backed up by violence. This kind of libertarianism falls apart as soon as you examine the origins of private property. Uh, this idea of, you know, uh, there's no violence, world free of coercion is absurd. That land was taken by force. Um, the resources were in many cases taken by force. And it, all backed up by a state that rests on a monopoly of violence. But on the other hand, of course, this does not mean that people don't have access to the things they need to survive. We already, many of us, don't have access to those things because they're being hoarded by a tiny uh, fraction of humanity. But rather, it's inverse. It's privatization that excludes others from access to the means of life. So yes, everyone has a right to access the things they need to survive and to the fruits of their labor, uh, but not to their exclusive use or access. I mean, in another related vein is that Earth is a shared resource that no one naturally owns. Resources should be managed communally and subject to democratic oversight to ensure sustainable and just use. Labor doesn't necessarily entail ownership, and we don't require labor for survival for the young, the old, not to mention those born into wealth who don't do any real labor anyway. So there's a whole mythology about um, labor and just rewards that, again, falls apart um, as soon as you really, you know, unpeel it a little bit more. And that's not to say there's anything inherently redeeming about capitalist labor anyway. Uh, ask the Trump boys or Hunter Biden for that matter. And if you look at the web of labor and dependencies of human infancy as well as old age, we're not the wholly independent autonomous creatures that uh, modern capitalism imagines anyway. We're deeply social creatures who must be taken care of and take care of others or perish. This independent bourgeois subject is another fiction that's done massive social harm and it's contradicted by basic family relationships. These care relations would be extended throughout society. Uh, not unlike the famous Star Trek quote, People are no longer obsessed with the accumulation of things. We have eliminated hunger, want, the need for possessions. We've grown out of our infancy. So social ecology takes this basic insight and extends it to the desire for a robust, fecund, post-scarcity, ecological, uh, eco-socialist society. And this is, if you look back at the, the history of a lot of science fiction, um, a lot of utopian fiction, there's a, there's a lot of commonality and convergence, these things, that there's a certain immaturity to the, the world of capitalism that we uh, are destined to outgrow. I wouldn't say that we're destined to outgrow it, but we should outgrow it. We need to work to uh, abolish it, to transcend the limits of our own current present society. Do you believe the greed of capitalism has any part in feeding production? Well, capitalism fuels all kinds of things, but almost all of them are unfortunately negative. Need has always driven most production, while pursuit of profit often hampers both production and innovation. In fact, farmers often destroy food surplus under capitalism to artificially create higher prices, to get rid of surplus. Um, crises of overproduction are very common. There's more stuff than buyers under capitalism, and of course, the people who really need it often don't have access to it because they have to pay for it through you know, being exchanged uh, through markets. So the argument that it fuels innovation is unconvincing. I mean, first of all, we've had uh, relatively few massive technological breakthroughs in the short period of time of the last 100 years of capitalism. Um, what we've had instead are lots of small changes to already existing technologies. As recently departed anarchist anthropologist David Graybird said, where in short are the flying cars? Where are the force fields, tractor beams, teleportation pods, anti-gravity sleds, tricorders, immortality drugs, colonies on Mars, and all the other technological wonders that any child growing up in the mid to late 20th century assumed would exist by now? Even those inventions that seemed ready to emerge, like cloning or cryogenics, ended up betraying their lofty promises. What happened to them? I don't mean to suggest that neoliberal capitalism or any other system can be successful in this regard. First, there's the problem of trying to convince the world that you're leading the way in technological progress when you're in fact holding it back. The United States with its decaying infrastructure, paralysis in the face of global warming, and we might add today COVID, and symbolically devastating abandonment of its manned space program just as China accelerates its own is doing a particularly bad public relations job. So that's an extended quote from an article by David Graeber that gives a lie to this idea of uh, capitalist growth and innovation. And second, I would also add that many non-capitalist nations, I certainly wouldn't call them socialist or hold them up as any kind of model, but just as counterfactuals, like the Soviet Union and China routinely have outpaced the technological developments of the United States. Um, it's worth pointing out that greed is antisocial and undermines the social cooperation and collective vision necessary for real technological breakthroughs and for their implementation on a wide social scale. Uh, there's very little money to be made today in producing things, material things, which is why elites have increasingly turned to financialization. 
make money out of thin air without worrying about factories, labor strikes, et cetera, et cetera, or simply extract rent from property with no real labor added, another increasingly important part of the fire economy. So meanwhile, at the same time, we're not seeing these massive explosions in technology. I mean, there's a few here and there. Of course, the internet was one, but uh, they exist alongside starvation, homelessness, public health crises, drug and suicide epidemics, because there's no money to be made in solving these problems and much money to be made in creating them through market-driven housing policies, torturing food surplus to artificially maintain higher prices, drug companies enriched from opioids and anti-depression medications, etc. So it's not just that the, um, these things are being ignored, but there's people who are actively profiting off their continuation, their existence. And this is another core insight into the nature of class society. We're not all in this together. So all this is not to say that competition and the drive to excellence is artificial or is going to disappear. Rather, it's institutions that encourage or discourage competition or cooperation and determine how surplus is created and used. Markets and self-interested individuals are very bad at this. Uh, what if the wealthiest people in the world innovated? Big, ugly stores with low prices, in the case of Sam Walton, or big online shops with low prices, like Jeff Bezos. Uh, meanwhile, real technological breakthroughs, like Salk uh, and his vaccine, he refused to patent the polio vaccine and made it freely available in stark contrast to what's happening now with COVID and the you know thousands of people who are going to die as we dither over um, pricing and distribution due to capitalism. Uh, the internet, along with many other technological advances, were actually publicly funded by research universities or the military or the government. They were not strokes of genius from individual entrepreneurs and scientists. And even supposed solo geniuses like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, or Bill Gates all rely on the knowledge and labor of millions of others. So capitalism encourages us to think in individual terms about production and innovation, but ignores that production is always social, as is the knowledge and creativity that innovation always emerges from. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. So a social ecological society would free humans from the compulsion of meaningless toil on pain of starvation or homelessness, unlocking massive untapped creativity, innovation, and productivity, and directed to more worthwhile things than the many meaningless and ecologically destructive innovations and products and commodities produced by the warped values of capitalism. So I believe that uh, a social ecological society beyond capitalism would be amazingly creative, amazingly innovative, because it would unlock these these stores of human potentiality that people are instead spending, you know, working as um, Uber drivers or doing the things they have to do just to survive, but uh, is robbing them of the free time and the focus to unlock their real potentiality. What are your thoughts on personal lifestyle changes like veganism, vegetarianism, and self-sustenance farming in pursuit of helping the environment? Do these help or is societal change the only way to go? Well, it's understandable that people don't want to contribute to making the world a worse place. But in our highly individualistic culture, the emphasis on personal lifestyle changes often replaces the need for organized social movements and resistance and alternative institutions. Both the nature of capitalist exchange and the historical record suggest it is highly unlikely that such uh, alternative economic institutions can beat capitalism at its own game or even survive. Often great energy is expended to offer products or services that modern capitalism can produce more cheaply and efficiently and for very dubious political gains. And this is true even of very long-standing and initially very political cooperatives such as Mondragon in Spain that's increasingly looked like a traditional firm. Because ultimately such enterprises remain hostage to the same market forces as any other business where almost every advance for workers' rights or ecology constitutes a competitive disadvantage against less scrupulous com competitors, which must be offset by higher prices. So as Theodore Adorno said, wrong life can't be lived rightly, or put a little differently, there can be no ethical consumption under capitalism. This is an illusion, and this really shows just how deep-set capitalist values are and that we can't think outside of the terms that the way that we we're going to change it is by consuming differently, consuming different products. That's a sign that we are very, very deeply set within the matrix. So these ideas have been around a very long time. These ideas of ethical consumption, uh, Orwell has some beautiful passages making fun of them from uh, quite a long time ago. And they've yet to change the world and often lead instead to escapist attempts to drop out of society or an elitist mentality that blames people for not adopting their own lifestyle changes, despite the fact that not everyone can run off and start an organic farm, even if they wanted to, or can af afford expensive, you know, vegan, organic, ethical foodstuffs, which require that ethical surcharge to offset the higher prices of, you know, either paying workers more or producing things more ecologically. The founder of uh, social ecology, Murray Bookchin, wrote a great polemic against individualist trends 
uh, in social movements called Social Anarchism or Lifestyle Anarchism. So this one was directed at the anarchist movement, which he eventually abandoned over some of these same debates, but a lot of the same arguments could be directed at the environmental movement. Um, and many of these critiques are still relevant today. Another great one is called No Local by Greg Scharzer, which argues that small-scale local alternatives cannot change the world due to the structural limits of capitalism and the need for organized political resistance. So that all being said, uh, I've been a vegetarian myself for 30 years now, and I have a little garden, I grow some of my own food. I just don't mistake this for political practice. I don't think this is actually how we're going to change the world. And in a world where we're deeply shaped by the norms of consumption and production, it's natural to start here with a quote-unquote practical alternative approach, but you can't consume or not consume or even small business your way out of the problems created by capitalism and the nation state structure to maintain it above all else. In that case, what do you see as the best route for implementing and popularizing social ecology ideas? Well, one recurring theme we get or comment we get very often is, this is what I've always believed. I never knew there was a name for it. So there, I would say there's a very widespread desire for a truly free, democratic, cooperative and ecological world, but we're so systematically disempowered politically and taught that there can be no alternative that we just we can't even conceive of it. So I would also suggest there's no singular route for spreading ideas and action. The ISE, the Institute for Social Ecology, we offer courses, summer seminars, conferences, lectures, workshops, and other structured educational forums, and I encourage everyone to check them out. But we also spread ideas by memes, Twitter, zines, stickers, YouTube, Instagram, podcasts, stencils, demonstrations, uh, tons of online forums and groups like Facebook, Reddit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a ton of massively creative energy out there spreading these ideas. Um, folks might check out the podcast Seriously Wrong that just did a three-part podcast series on social ecology. You can uh, check out the meme Google Murray Bookchin. And we reside at the intersection of social movements and academia. So we do a lot of movement reflection, education, and networking work. So political praxis is also one of the best forms of education. You'll learn more um, organizing demonstrations, organizing your workplace um, than you can in many cases in a more traditional educational setting. Ideally, you'll have a place where you can uh, bring those two into conversation, and that's always what the Institute tries to do. As to implementing these ideas, we encourage everyone to check out the newly formed political organization Symbiosis, which can be found online at uh, www.symbiosis-revolution.org. It's building a network of organizations and individuals committed to direct democracy, socialism, and an ecological world. Uh, we also have lots of comrades working in the eco-socialist and libertarian socialist caucuses of the Democratic Socialist of America. I'm a member of as well. And there's lots of like-minded people in various other movements as well, from the Sunrise Movement, Extinction Rebellion, Industrial Workers of the World, to the Yellow Vest. Desire for a democratic, um, non-capitalist, ecological world is out there. There's a lot of different potential avenues to reaching it. Uh, if there's no lo local group that you feel or you feel uh, politically isolated in your hometown, write us and we'll happily send you some information on how to start a study group that can become the nucleus for local organizing. Spreading ideas is really key, but so is organizing around them. We have to go beyond both individual lifestyle change and the anemic electoral politics that are designed to uphold the status quo. We have to build institutions of dual power that meet people's needs in a different way while building oppositional political power against capitalism its state apparatus, and all systems of domination. Now that's a tall order, but a necessary and inspiring one if we're to have not only a habitable planet, but a society organized around human flourishing rather than the mindless accumulation of profit and power and things. As Murray Bookchin said, if we do not do the impossible, we shall be faced with the unthinkable. These words, I would say, remain true today, and we need everyone on board, so join the fight. Do you have any closing thoughts? Thanks again for the invitation to talk about social ecology. I hope listeners will check out some of the programs we offer. www.social-ecology.org. Our courses run more or less quarterly, and we have a ton of readings and videos on our site and our YouTube channel and our Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. So get involved and join a global community of activist learners who are changing the world. Thanks again. Thank you for coming on. You can find all of the links he mentioned in the description below. Thanks for watching and goodbye.